And we're now streaming on YouTube, which is great. Great, I think I'm gonna get started. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Christine Schmidt and I'm the Deputy Director of the Wiener Holocaust Library. Very pleased to welcome you to this event with Hadley Freeman, Esther Saffron Foer, and Dr. Dan Lee. Um, we are delighted to welcome everyone, um, our, our usual audiences who um, join us in London. Um, the Wiener Holocaust Library, for those of you who don't know, is located in London. Um, and we are one of the oldest institutions uh, collecting documents um, and published books on the Holocaust and other genocides. Uh, we were founded by Dr. Alfred Wiener in the 1920s um, and he began collecting and uh, disseminating information about the rise of the Nazis as it was happening. And his work has formed the foundation of our work today. Um, we also have a vibrant exhibitions and events series. And of course the current situation has uh, prompted us to, to change how we work a bit and to um, make more of our offering available online. So this is our first uh, foray into online book talks. So please be patient as we try to muddle through a bit of the, um, the technological challenges. Um, if, if you've been joining a lot of events via Zoom, you know that this is kind of par for the course. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm happy to welcome everyone who usually comes to our events in London, um, and I could, you will be spared the usual housekeeping kind of um, talk that I give about fire escape and all of that stuff. Um, but I'm also extending a warm welcome to those of you who may have always wanted to join uh, in our events, but are, are joining in from abroad, which is, it's, so it's, it's great to see you. Um, Hadley and Esther's books are also particularly relevant to us at the library because we specialize in supporting uh, researchers who are conducting family research. And you can learn more about this and about our exhibitions and events on our website, which I'll include in the chat um, a bit later. Um, and essentially how this is going to work, I'm going to introduce our speakers shortly and you can feel free to submit questions via the Q&A feature. Um, or via the uh, chat feature directly to the panelists. And um, I'm also going to help uh, field those. If you're logging in from YouTube and you'd like to tweet us questions, please feel free to do that. My colleague, Lara, is here also to help um, moderate those. So we will try to get to as many questions as possible after the uh, formal conversation between Dan Hadley and Esther. So now to introduce our speakers, uh, Hadley Freeman, uh, welcome. She grew up in New York City and London. She's been a staff writer at The Guardian since uh, 2000 and has contributed to many other publications, including Vogue. This is her fourth book, and she lives in London with her partner and their three children. Esther Saffron Foer, also welcome, is the former president of the public relations firm FM Strategic Communications, and most recently served for 10 years as the executive director of the synagogue Sixth and I in Washington, DC, where, from where she's joining us now. Uh, she stepped down from her position to write this memoir, and she's also worked extensively in politics. Her first job in the field was in 1972, working on the presidential campaign for George McGovern. Her husband, Bert Foer, is a leading antitrust attorney, and her literary sons are, as you may know, are Franklin Foer, Jonathan Saffron Foer, and Joshua Foer. And uh, last but not least, um, Dr. Dan Lee is a lecturer in modern French history at Queen Mary University of London, our neighbor and is a historian of the Second World War and a specialist in the history of Jews in France and North Africa during the Holocaust. His books include Pétain's Jewish Children, French Jewish Youth and the Vichy Regime from 1940 to 1942. And his second book, The SS Officer's Armchair is coming out this year and examines the life of a low ranking SS officer from Stuttgart whose personal documents were recently discovered sewn into the cushion of an armchair. So um, I'm going to be putting up the links for um, being able to purchase all of these books or pre-order these books by the end um, of our session. And with that, without further ado, I'm handing over to Dan Lee. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so, okay, these are two extraordinary books which really complement each other in so many fantastic ways. Um, one of course is written from the point of view of the second generation, um, Esther, and whereas Hadley takes us on the journey of what it's like to be following the footsteps rather of um, the third generation. So I think in lieu of asking you for a sort of summary 
uh, of your books, I thought rather it might be more interesting to think of a question that might bring these two amazing books together. And I think what I would like to do, therefore, is to think about the two central characters, well, two cent for me, the two central characters in these books, both of whom are women. So we have Esther's mother and Hadley's grandmother, whose lives span the entire 20th century, beginning in Eastern Europe and ending up in the United States. So to kick us off, could you tell us a little bit about these two women and why you chose to center your narratives around them? So I Okay, so I, shall I start? So um, uh, my heroine is my mother. She was born in 1920 uh, in, she would have told you she was born in Poland, which she was, but when I went back to visit, it was Ukraine. It was the part of the world that was changing hands repeatedly. Uh, and the names of the villages were also changing whenever the, um, whenever it changed hands at, when a different government was ruling it. She was, um, I, from everything I can tell about her, she was the ultimate survivor, that even as a kid, that she was always the one uh, getting into little trouble. When the war broke out and everybody was gathering in the main square of, of the town, of her shtetl, she immediately went back to her house, grabbed, it was in June, she grabbed a winter coat, a pair of scissors and a change of clothes and she left. And she followed her, she followed the retreating Russian army but she used her intuition, her instincts and it made it all the way to Kazakhstan and ultimately back when she heard that her shtetl was liberated. And even in the United States, she was, uh, her grandchildren used to call her, call her their superhero yeah, even in her great grandchildren, uh, she was just she was under five feet tall, uh, very strong willed, and um, was the epitome of a survivor for all of us. Great. Uh, so I uh, first wanted to write about my grandmother, my grandma Sala, who's my father's mother. And I first started about I first thought about writing this book in 2000. Uh, she died in 1994. Um, like Esther's mother, she was also born in Eastern Europe um, in a, in a shtetl in what is now Poland, but what was the, the Austro uh, Austro Hungarian Empire. Um, and I wanted to write her about her because she always had this sadness about her. All I knew was that she was French and that she came to America to get away from the war. And that's all I knew. And the story that I was always taught in my Hebrew school in New York, and then later when we moved to London here as well, was that the Jewish immigrants who got out of Eastern Europe or in, got out of France in my grandmother's case, were, were the happy ones. They were the lucky ones. They were so grateful to arrive at Ellis Island. You know, their, their lives were you know, blessed. Whereas those who had to stay behind in this dark continent of death, which was Europe in the 1930s for Jews, they were the really unlucky ones. But I'd been to France and I met my grandmother's brothers who had stayed behind and they lived extraordinary lives and they lived very happy lives and they were extremely wealthy. One of them married the love of his life. The other one was leading this extraordinary career. You know, was friends with Picasso, Chagall, you know, just the dream. And there was my grandmother who was, when I knew her, a housewife in Miami who was very unhappy. And that was, that was always obvious. And I wanted to write about that and I had no idea how to do this. And then after several years of sort of beginning to poke at archives and everything, I found a shoebox in the back of her closet. And that's what set me off on this path. And even though the book became actually about my grandmother and her brothers, and at times I thought maybe I should just write about her brothers because they had much more adventurous, uh, con you know, conventionally exciting lives. I always knew I wanted to write about my grandmother because I just felt that women's stories are often left out of wartime narratives because women don't really get to do very much in the war and certainly not back then. You know, my grandmother's brothers, they joined, well, two of them joined the army and one of them ran around the country hidden, um, sort of making copies of documents and saving lots of French towns and French ports and French people's bank accounts. So he was, you know, they were all living lives of daring do and doing exciting stuff. Whereas the only option available to my grandmother was to get married. That was the only thing she could do in the war. That was all she could do to escape was to marry a man that she didn't know. And these are not stories that get told because these are not stories that you find in archives. These are stories of emotional interiority rather than external heroism. 
and I wanted to tell that story. Well, there's definitely no danger of women being left out in, in both of your stories. <laughs> um, so as a follow-up to those questions, what, what I found most interesting in, 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 a, in both of these books was actually the period after the war. So we're obviously going to talk about um, before and after, but perhaps it, it just seemed to me that in, in the 1950s must have been a very complicated place for both of these women in the United States, thinking back, reflecting on their uh, relationship uh, with Europe. Now, some people we know as historians came to really identify themselves with this term survivor at different stages of the post-war period. A lot of people who had perhaps been in a concentration camp would use that label. So I'm just curious, thinking about your, your, your mother and your grandmother after the war, how, how did they sort of adapt and, and think about um, themselves and Europe and this, this label of survivor? Is it something that either of them ever spoke about or wrote about? Uh, so my mother, when we came to the United States, I was born in post-war Europe. Um, and when we came to the United States in 1949, she didn't call herself a survivor. In, in her mind, it was only people who had survived concentration camps that were really survivors. She was on the run and life was plenty difficult. There were times when she didn't have enough to eat, when she was hiding in barns, or she took that winter coat and cut it up and repatched it uh, to make sure that she had some way to stay warm, that she worked in munitions factories and she worked in rice fields. But in the United States, you know, here you were supposed to come to the Golden of Medina, the land filled with golden, uh, the, where the roads were filled with gold. And in fact, coming here, uh, she didn't think of herself as a Holocaust survivor. That was sort of a different status. But also she came to a family, to her aunts, but nobody wanted to hear about what was going, what had happened. I don't know whether it was out of guilt that they hadn't done more whether they didn't want to hear the horrific details, uh, but survivors were told to, you know, we're so glad you're here, forget about the past and just get on with your life. Uh, and that was not always so easy. And uh, actually it was probably never so easy. Um, four years after we came here, my father committed suicide. While my mother was the ultimate survivor, um, he had lost a, a wife and a child uh, during the war. And my sense is that probably while he walked out of Europe, he wasn't a survivor. Um, so my mother had to just pick herself up one more time and get moving again. And I remember sitting with her on the lawn of our apartment building where we would look for four leaf clovers and uh, it was such a great image. I still have them. I pasted them on a sheet. Some of them come apart. But she was always looking into the future. She was looking for hope. And I think it's that search for hope that meant she was going to find it. Um, and she did. She was, a, she was a happy person, despite everything that happened to her. She was always smiling and laughing and taking care of people. And even as, as a widow uh, with two little children, she would loan people money that needed it because I found the letters later in a box, kind of like the one Hadley found where people would say, thank you so much, but please don't tell anybody. And here's the check. Um, so yeah, life was hardly perfect. Uh, and after the war, she would, my parents, Went, were in a uh, German displaced persons camp. But despite everything that happened, no place in the world wanted them. Nobody wanted 250 to 300,000 Jews who had survived the war. Nobody knew what to do with them. And in our case, we, we came to the United States. We had a relative guarantee that we wouldn't be a burden to the state, but we still had to sneak in because we had to falsify documents to qualify under the 1948 DP Immigration Act. And I think that's kind of indicative of what people thought about survivors. Mm -hmm. What about your grandmother, Hadley? How did she fit into that mosaic? Uh, she absolutely did not think of herself as a survivor. What she thought of herself was French. Um, so just give quick 
background. My, she was actually born, like I said, in what is now Poland. And she went to Paris when she was 14. And she was there until she was 26, at which point she married a man she didn't know and didn't love uh, in America to get out of France at her brother's urging. And for the rest of her life, she thought of herself as very much French. And her whole identity was based on this. She dressed in very French clothes. She talked in an extremely French accent until the day she died, even though she lived in America for almost 60 years and lived in France, as I said, for only 12. So her identity was not on surviving. Her identity was not about um, you know, the future. It was entirely really about the past. It was about these, these 12 happy years that she'd had. And that's, that's kind of what I'd always picked up on her. Mm. Oh, and I, I suppose, keeping keeping along this theme, um, again, there's but, but, so those. I'm so pleased that okay, we we managed to start off uh, in this way. But I'd like to shift the focus a little bit now to thinking about the men in the book, because again, there's two very dominant. I know this wasn't intended in Hadley's book, but there is <laughs> one character that really just drives and pushes this narrative forward, like a jack in the box. Like I'm sure that you know you were trying to be very fair to your your relatives, but this particular character really, I think for me, just you know, is the central force. And similarly, in, in Esther's case, it, it's your father. Um, you write Esther, you know, outlasting the war didn't mean surviving. I just thought that was such, such beautiful words. Both of these men, they, they really reminded me of each other. The, 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 their pasts are just shrouded in so much secrecy. There's so much, both of you really had your work cut out to really find out who actually these two characters were. So could you just tell us a little bit about, you know, the research process that actually, because you know, you are starting in some ways with, lots of stories, family stories, but in, in, in other ways, you're starting with blank slates. So if you could tell us a bit about the men. Uh, so I'll start again. I, I had kind of a blank slate. Uh, when we came to the United States, I have lots of pictures of our life in the DP camp, which is kind of interesting of the displaced persons camp. That was actually an, in, uh, I would say almost a happy time. Uh, our, our families had, my parents had both survived the unthinkable. They had lost everything and they were suddenly forming this new community and they were forming it with people who were having babies who had the highest birth rate of any place in the world. Um, and these babies were adored. Uh, my father, while well, uh, well, the stories I learned about him, so this was this blank slate. He, he committed suicide when I was about eight. Uh, he didn't really have family in the United States, not close family, he had family. And there was nobody to hear stories from. And my mother, whenever I would ask her, she'd say, we didn't talk about the past. We were all about moving forward. Uh, they wanted to just um, blank out the past. And in my father's case, which I didn't know growing up, that he had a family, a wife and a daughter that were murdered, um, was you know just another level of something to, um, to blot out from your past. What I do know is after the war, and I know this because I ultimately met some of his partners and people that he knew from the shuttle that he grew up, they ran a, he and some partners for about a year, year and a half, had a kind of deli bar in Lodz, Poland, um, which apparently was not really about the food. It was about changing money. The Jews, everybody was trying to figure out where they were gonna go. And because Warsaw had been completely destroyed, Lodz was kind of a crossroads. And my father and his partners would just in their heads kind of quickly figure out what the exchange rates were and change money and slip somebody a drink. Uh, and then in the DP camp, um, I know that I had lots of toys and clothes because my father ran a very successful black market business. And here was this man who, who clearly was clever and was strong and then came here and just couldn't go on. My mother described him, I, I didn't ask a lot of questions because I knew that she didn't want to talk about it. And part of being a second generation Holocaust survivor is that you don't ask questions, you learn to maneuver. That uh, 
you understand that if you ask too many questions, you're going to be causing your mother pain and she doesn't want to tell you anything because she doesn't want to cause you pain. Um, she said that from the moment she met him, he was always on the run. He was running from one thing to the next. And for some reason, here in the United States, the road ended. Mm -hmm. And that's all I knew uh, until I started to meet people by chance. It wasn't a systematic kind of investigation. Pieces started, so our, our middle son wrote a book called Everything is Illuminated, which is a work of fiction. Uh, he was in Ukraine in 1998 as a college senior, spent a couple of days trying to dig up some information for his senior thesis, didn't come up with anything. So wrote this kind of magical realism novel and people started to come to me and say, I can't believe he wrote about our shtetls that way. This was just not entirely, it wasn't true. It wasn't like that. He's, he's destroying the memory of this place that I loved. So it was because of his book uh, that people started to call and he was done with the story. He had moved on to his next book. He would give me notes from people or business cards of people who would stop by at one of his book talks and say, oh, you know, I came from this village. And at some point I decided to start following up. And that's how I started putting pieces together. Right. And Hadley, Hadley you, you in a sense, take us off from that, from that moment, don't you? Yours really does begin actually as a journey of, of discovery. Yes, so I think you're referring to my great uncle Alex and him, uh, his presence in the book. And I love that, that, I love Dan that you ask, how did you do this research when I should let all viewers out there know it was actually done with you and you found out most of the interesting stuff. Daniel, I have to say to everyone, was my great research Sherpa during the writing of my book after I kidnapped him at a resistance conference and dragged him around French archives with me for the next seven, eight years. Um, so that's so how I did the research. Well, you probably would be a better place to answer. But he, uh, my great uncle Alex, I knew him pretty well. He died in 1999 and I was 21. Um, I knew that he had been a great art collector. I knew that from going to his flat in Paris on the Avenue Foch and you walk in, there's like Monet's water lilies, Van Gogh's, Degas, Giacometti's, you know, everything in his apartment um, and he was friends with Picasso. Picasso had done the poster for his gallery, the Gallery Elysee, um, but I had no idea what to, how to tell his story because everything he told us uh, when I was growing up we all assumed was lies um, and thanks to Daniel uh, I learned how to use French archives and we were able to trace biographical details about him um, and I don't want to give anything away but it, it turns out that everyone in the family massively underestimated great uncle Alex because pretty much everything he told us was true. You can give something away, surely. Oh, you can something away, it. okay. All right, I'll give this story away. So <laughs> Alex had always said that he'd been arrested um, and was put on one, a train to the concentration camps and, and escaped from the train. And I'd always thought this sounded like absolute nonsense as my great uncle, who at that point was a couturier and about five foot two. And how on earth could this little, you know, friend, you know fashion designer escape from a train to a concentration camp? So Daniel and I first went to the archive in Paris and we saw the lists of the, you know, this is a bad term of passengers, list of people getting off the train at Drancy, which would have been the French concentration camp he was sent to. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a Zoom crasher in the room. Max, this is my my son, Max, who is crashing my talk. Max, you have to go to bed. Sorry, I'm now the BBC dad now. His <laughs> children <laughs> crash their event. <laughs> Sorry, now everyone gets an insight into what my working life at home is like. So anyway, so Daniel and I went to the archives. There was no record of Alex getting off at Dronsey. Okay, well, that just proves he never went to the camp. That doesn't prove anything. And then Daniel and I went down to Nice, went to the archives, and there was Alex's name in the list that he had gotten on the train. Now, at this point, Daniel is the one who does all the clever work. I'm just giving all credit to you now. And you phoned around various resistance museums in the middle of France, asking if anyone had ever heard of some Jewish man jumping off a train. And this man called Robert Picandet, who ran a resistance museum in Auvergne, called back and said, oh, yes, there's some lady here. She remembers a short Israelite who was a couturier. Do you remember something? So then Daniel and I went on a trip that was a lot like, to be honest, a, a story from everything is illuminated. Daniel and I then went on this car journey to the Auvergne to this woman's house. 
thinking this is going to be total nonsense. How on earth, you know, could this actually be the woman who, who protected Alex during the war? And we go to this tiny little house in the middle of woodland. She's even shorter than Alex. She's about four foot tall. So it's like something out of a fairy tale, this tiny little lady living in the middle of the forest, living in a shoe, basically. And we go into her house. And she said, oh, yes, my parents protected your uncle. It was in this house. I said, oh, right, Alex was in this house. She said, oh, yes. And she brought out these photos. And there are about a dozen photos of my great uncle Alex actually staying in that house. And she took us up to his bedroom, which was hidden in the attic. She showed us the two hidden stairways, one going through the kitchen, one coming out the garage. So if Alex needed to escape, if there were police coming up one staircase, he could go down the other. It was pretty amazing. So that's that is the story of my great uncle Alex, and that, to be honest, is only the start of my of the story of my great uncle Alex. Exactly. But and and similarly, Esther, I mean that that must that story must resonate with you quite a lot. It's what the example Hadley just gave of the actual, you know, rolling up the sleeves, getting on an airplane, going to these uh, locations to find out about well where where these ancestors came from and what what you can find out about them because your uh, part of your quest, if if, if is really to, to uncover something quite similar in that, in that sense in Ukraine. Right. Um, so I, you know, I did research in archives. I, I uh, did research at the Library of Congress, uh, the Holocaust Museum, but ultimately I knew I had to talk to real people. And in 2009, decided that I needed to go to Ukraine. And um, I went with my oldest son and we were meeting a group of Israelis there, actually a group of Israelis and Americans who were descendants or survivors of one of the shtetls. And that just turned out to be the, a good time to go. We weren't gonna go alone. We could visit the shtetls with these other people and then we could go off and do our research. Um, and I had a picture that my mother had had forever and she said, these are the people who hid your father for some part of the war. She didn't know for how long. She didn't know where they lived. It was what Jonathan was looking for when he went to Ukraine in 1998 and he didn't find them. Uh, but because of his book, people started to tell me, well, it wasn't really this shuttle. It was a little further down. It was another shuttle and he was with so-and-so. So I now had more information. I knew that I'd sent Jonathan to the wrong place. It wasn't the wrong place, it's where my grandmother was killed, but, uh, and where a lot of the family was, but it wasn't where my father was. So for me, it meant hiring people. I didn't wanna just kind of go cold. I was going all the way to Ukraine. It was a big deal trip. Uh, so I hired uh, a young researcher who knew the area, who worked for some friends of mine and uh, seemed to be really, really committed to the story. And she went now to this new village that I had learned about. Tiny little place with one long dirt road and houses lined on both sides. And she started showing my picture around, the copy of my picture. And somebody immediately looked at it and said, oh, it's Label and David. Label was my father's name. And they said, well, his grandson still lives in the house. And she went to the house and she took pictures of the pictures that were hanging on the wall to see. She was convinced she'd made a match. She sent the pictures to me. I wasn't so sure. You know, I kind of, I wanted to believe it, but on the other hand, I couldn't believe it. It's, I didn't really expect to find anything. Um, so uh, in, my, in my investigative journey, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a lawyer who worked for, you know, we live in Washington for a congressional committee and was an investigator and said, I know these guys who are former FBI agents. And one of them specializes in photography, call them. So I made an appointment, I hired this guy to spend an hour with me to analyze the photographs to look at the distances between various features, you know, the distance from the nose to the ear, where the, uh, all the measurements. And we spent an hour doing that. And at the end of the hour, he looked at me and says, you know, I really can't tell you it's them. And then he said, but I can't tell you it's not them. 
And he gave me some clues. He said, when you go to Ukraine, there are lots of things you should look for. First of all, you should try to measure those distances. You should make sure the pictures were taken at the same angle. And he said, also look at the clothes these people were wearing. These are not, pe these are peasants essentially. They didn't have big wardrobes. And if they were getting their photograph taken, it's likely it would have been in the same clothes. And that turned out to be a really important clue for me. And like Hadley, I don't know if I'm gonna give away, I wanna give away the rest unless Daniel thinks I should. <laughs> No, no, no. We can, um, we, we can definitely, uh, you can keep us on the edge of our seats for now. Perhaps okay. it will, might come up in a minute. I can see um, we've already generating quite a few questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, do type it into the Twitter feed. Is that right, Christine? Just nod if... Um, you can type it into the Twitter feed if you're watching from YouTube or if you want to tweet it, it's also fine. But you can also type it into the chat. Uh, function, which is at the bottom, usually at the bottom of the screen. So do keep those questions coming and I'll turn to those uh, shortly. Um, so again, something that we started with that perhaps we can we can come back to is this difference that as I see it between the second generation and the third generation. And this is something which, which I found really fascinating in those in both of these books, because both of you in your respective ways really talk about um, these two positions. So Hadley, you're talking about things you did that your dad perhaps couldn't do. Whereas Esther, you're talking about things that your children do that you couldn't do. So I'm just curious, you know, thinking about the relationship between the second and third generation with, you know, the survivor. Is there something, you know, what, what, can, the third, what can the third generation do that's beyond the reach of the second generation. It just seemed to me that a lot of doors were sometimes open for people like Hadley and Jonathan, but they might have been closed to Esther and to Hadley's dad. Hadley, Hadley why don't you kick us off? I think if you grow up with that proximity to the tragedy, i.e. your parent experienced this, it's just too much to ask them questions about it. It's just like looking into the sun and every day you're living with the vibes they give off that they don't want to talk about it. You know, my father and his cousins all grew up watching their parents turn off the TV every time a Holocaust documentary came on. Um, my grandmother's oldest brother, Henri, had a child, Danielle. And if Danielle or her children ever asked Henri about you know, being Jewish or being Hebrew or anything, or, you know, speaking Hebrew, he would just say, Shh, don't, don't, don't. Like they really didn't want anything. They were trying to protect their children. And if they asked anything about the Holocaust, there was no answer um, because it was just too painful for them. And, uh, you know, even though I'm quite removed, I'm the third generation, I didn't even live in the same state as my grandmother or in the same country as my great uncles. I also picked up on this, which is why when I was 22, I started thinking about writing something about it. And it took me another 20 years to kind of get the courage together to actually you know, sit down and actually write the damn thing, as opposed to procrastinate by dragging Daniel around France to another archive with me. So I think Hadley really nailed it. Uh, it. I was too close to it. I was too close to my mother. And I heard one of my sons recently say, well, you know, mom, you really used child labor. <laughs> uh, that uh, when our oldest son was in high school. There were, he had to do a senior research project and he could pick anything he wanted. And I encouraged him to interview his grandmother. Now, why, why didn't I do it? Because I couldn't have had that conversation with her. A, I don't think she would have talked to me the way she would talk to him. With me, she just seems, sees pain from one generation to the other. With her grandchildren, she sees immortality. She sees her story living on. And also, uh, I think Daniel, you mentioned the point of, I wasn't emotionally ready to step into that space. Um, so our oldest son, Frank did, he spent six weeks with her. That was the time of the senior project. He took her to every grocery store. She was not like Hadley's grandmother. She was not French. She was very much Eastern European and a coupon clipper and a bargain seeker. And he spent six weeks taking her to every grocery store with every coupon she wanted, uh, which none of the rest of us would ever do. And he put a tape recorder between them in the car. And so he was able to put together the outline, the framework of the story. 
Uh, and, it, and it was a pretty powerful story and we got a lot out of it. And then of course, when Jonathan needed the senior project, um, his idea was to spend a summer in Prague with a friend and then to figure out a way to turn that into a senior project. And again, I suggested maybe he go to Ukraine. What did he think of it? We were exploring ideas for this project at family dinner. And I came up with this one, go to Ukraine, see if you can find the family that hid your grandfather. And ultimately that's what he went for. And it wasn't until 11 years after his trip that I took my own trip. And I think, you know, A, I was using my sons uh, who, who were ready to be part of the story. Um, and, but I, I wasn't there. I always thought of myself, and I think I say this in the book, as the hinge, mm. hinge between this powerful woman, this tiny little powerful woman who was so strong and these boys uh, who I had raised who turned out to be storytellers. And it wasn't until the other day when I, I used the hinge analogy with somebody and they said, well, you know, doors are only there with, can only be there with hinges. And I was able to be the hinge to open the story. Right. And Hadley, what about you in terms of your dad? What's, um, what's his role in, in this? Is it similar to Esther? Is it sort of, is he trying to dig, dig, dig up some of the past in the same way or? Uh, I would say 100% no. Um, but his role was helping me and which he really did. I don't mean that's what he was put on this earth to, but that is what he, he did with the book. So I could call him anytime, email him anything. And these were questions that were difficult for him. You know, he didn't want to think about his mother's unhappiness. He loved his mother very much. He didn't want to think about his parents being unhappily married. He loved both of them. There, you know, there's no villain in that marriage. Um, so it was very hard for him at times and for my uncle and, you know, they were nothing but generous and supportive um, the whole way. And, you know, sending me photos, sending me whatever they could find. And it was my uncle Rich, so my father's younger brother, who was very close to his parents. It was him who found my great uncle Alex's unpublished memoir, which had, which was hidden in my grandmother's belongings. Um, my, my uncle Rich still lives in my grandmother's apartment. So her stuff is still there. And it was him finding that uh, memoir which actually laid out, you know, what everybody was doing day by day. So I could kind of connect the dots of everything that Daniel and I had found in archives and in letters and stuff. It was him finding that memoir that enabled me to write this memoir. So I'm incredibly grateful to him. Mm. Okay, um, before, before I open up to questions, one last thing I'd like to, to think about, which is perhaps going forward and thinking a little bit about the future and the ways that perhaps some of the stories you've uncovered since going on this journey, now that these journeys, I don't know if they are over actually, they're probably not over in lots of ways, even though the books are published. Um, but how, how do you keep these stories alive going forward in your own families? Esther. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you know, it's, uh, as I said, I, for some reason, raised three storytellers. Uh, all of our sons have written books, um, different kinds of books. One is a novelist, one is a political scientist, one is an evolutionary biologist. But um, growing up in a home uh, where there were so many memories we couldn't talk about, uh, the ones we could, the ones we could capture became very important. Uh, growing up, so we all grew up in the same city. My mother lived in the same city we did. She was ever a presence in our lives and in the lives now of our grandchildren. Um, and the stories just became precious. And in the course of writing the book, I, uh, you know, of course did a lot of reading and research and came across something interesting, which a lot of scholars have written about the Jews are a people of memory not a people of history, that we don't look at the, well, we, I'm sure we do look at the broad scope of history, but when we talk about the Exodus, for example, we don't talk about when it happened and the numbers of people, and we talk about our story. We see ourselves as though we're going out of Egypt. And I think that's so terribly important. We are reminded over and over again to remember, remember Zakor, that's, um, so it's, it's, it's very much in the Jewish tradition. 
Um, and it's very much in our family's tradition that history is about the past. It's a story about something that happened, but memory is taking that and going forward. History is the end of something. Memory is the beginning of something. And I wrote this book. I didn't know that it was going to become a book. I just realized that if these stories were going to be preserved, that I was going to have to do it. And, uh, you know, I wrote it for my grandchildren and their grandchildren so that these, the, these stories and these memories will continue. Um, so, yes, I, I agree with Esther. I mean, I wrote the book kind of for my children, one of whom you've met tonight. Um, and there's two more somewhere in the house. Um, and I just wanted to write a book that uh, was readable, really, to people who might not pick up, you know, traditional kind of Jewish narratives. Or I wanted to make this feel like a, like a family saga. Some people have asked, you know, were you thinking of other Jewish books when you wrote it? And the truth is, I wasn't as heretical as it sounds. I was kind of thinking more of like the Foresight saga and kind of those group biographies, which I love so much, like the Mitford sisters, not that they would particularly thank me for using their lives as a model for a story about Jews. But anyway, I just wanted to write a kind of thumping family saga and hopefully that's what keeps it alive. People know that these are individuals with personalities, with hopes and loves and, you know, dashed dreams. And that's really the story. Okay, so I'm going to open up now to questions, if I may. And a couple of people uh, have, have written in to ask um, Esther about the DP camp and the experience, what it was like for you uh, in the DP camp. I actually found that one of the most amazing parts of your book, um, especially when you write, you had this, this idea that, you know, the, if these were originally POW camps and then they were after the war, they were being used to house Nazis and then it was the Jews' turn. So that's... That's where you, and that really struck me that moment. But we've got a couple of questions from people who'd like to know about your memories of the camp and where, what you managed to retain, well, physically actually, whether you any of the objects or photographs or anything like that. Um, oh, uh, kept. Yes, uh, to me, that was also one of the interesting uh, parts that I wrote about because I, I have a lot of pictures. I mean, who knew that as life was being reborn, in the shadow of the Holocaust, that these people in the DP camps were taking so many pictures. Uh, I don't know who had the cameras and how they were developed, uh, but they were. The Jewish National Fund was even selling cards with pictures of palm trees, Shanatova cards. And there's one of those with my mother and I, you know, in these palm trees, which were hardly uh, existing in the DP camps. Uh, so I looked at all these pictures that I had and I said, wow, you know, I was really a happy little kid. And, you know, there are pictures with my parents and there are pictures of birthday parties and picnics with other people in the camps. And then I would take a closer look at the pictures in a way that I hadn't originally. And I would see army barracks. I would see barbed wire. Uh, I saw watchtowers, you know, right behind this happy family was a watchtower. And so I started reading about that period in history. And, and, you know, most of us have this image, the war ended, the Jews went off and everybody lived happily ever after. Well, it just wasn't like that. Uh, the DP camps were kind of a, a buried part of the story. There were 250 to 300,000 refugees, nowhere to go, nobody wanted them. The allies wanted them to go back home. Uh, to repatriate them to the countries they came from. Well, that just wasn't, that wasn't an option. Their families have been totally wiped out in these places. My mother saw somebody walking down the street in her sister's dress. So these camps were created. They had to be created quickly. They were created out of anything that was an empty space, including con former concentration camps. Uh, some of them were in nicer places. Our particular DP camp, uh, when I researched it, had been a former POW camp. The Germans had used it to... Uh, Can you just remind us what it was called, your camp? We were in several camps, but that was the first one. We moved in right as the POWs moved out. We moved into army barracks. I would say to my mother, well, how about the crib? She said, crib? You know, we slept on army cots. The place was filthy. The refugees had to clean it up. There weren't proper facilities. 
It wasn't toilet paper. There weren't all the things that you would, it was, it was a, for prisoners of war, it wasn't heated. And uh, Jews went from one of these camps to another as, as the allies were shifting the populations. Uh, the, the allied soldiers, there are, I, I don't know what the British camps were like. We happened to be in the American zone. Uh, and General Patton, who was a known anti-Semite, had written in his diary that the Jews under his control were subhuman. The allied soldiers were not the same as, as soldiers who had liberated the camps. Those soldiers had gone home and there were new soldiers sent over and a lot of them with anti-Semitic feelings. Uh, and the Jews, of course, you know, were wanting to move on. They wanted to control their lives. They didn't want to be controlled by another group of soldiers who didn't understand them. Often the conversations between the refugees and the soldiers was translated by a German translator. And we don't know exactly how that went all the time. So it was, it was a beautiful period because life was born because schools and camps were set up, you know, kids camps, mm. but it was a horrible period because there was nowhere to go because the, the conditions were often just horrific. And I was thinking of Hadley talking about her grandmother and her clothes. When I look at the pictures in the DP camp, I always see my father in a suit and tie and maybe a fedora. They were wearing aspirational clothes. They were looking for a new life and a much better life and, and they wanted dignity. And the uh, people who were managing the camps weren't always interested in providing dignity to these people who weren't listening to them and who were, in their mind, uh, indignant. Thank you. I mean, one of, before I ask the next question, one of the most amazing things I took away from that section of your book was where you talk about the number of former Nazis or even pe people who still found themselves in these camps. And you give it, it, an example of uh, not, uh, former Nazi midwives actually working, yes. helping bring babies. A friend of mine uh, was born in Passau. Um, she now lives in Canada. And her mother would not allow allow her to be born in the camp. There was some sort of a hospital facility in the camp and her mother felt too many babies are dying. So they put together all the money they had and she was born in a hospital in the town. And there, had, there was ultimately an investigation about over 50 babies were killed by a Nazi midwife. This is after the war. And the army had, in, the, the US Army had investigated it. Apparently she was somehow pressing the fontanelle and in, instantly killing these children born after the war was over. So it was, it was a difficult period. Right. Um, Hadley, could you tell us a little bit about whether researching and writing these books made you change your mind on anything and, and how it might have done that? I don't know if it changed my mind, really. Um, it definitely made me more determined that my children grow up with a strong sense of their Jewish identity. Um, and it also, I'm sure, sharpened my awareness of contemporary uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, mm -hmm. Very much motivating factors in me finally sitting down and writing this book after 20 years of faffing about were um, the election of Donald Trump, um, who was elected on a very nationalistic platform, the Brexit referendum, ditto, um, and the anti-Semitism scandals going on in the Labour Party. And so those things motivated me to write it, and I'm sure me writing it then made me even more aware of those factors in the politics, and also obviously the rise of anti-Semitism on the far right in Europe. So, I, you know, it was a kind of circular thing, really. I wrote it because of those things, and in writing it, I became more aware of those things. Yeah. What about you, Esther? Did any of those uh, political events, you know, around 2015, 16, 17, did any of this come, somehow fit into the, the narrative? Well, um, I mean, of course, the refugee crisis around the world. Um, mm. There was actually, our family had, it took in a refugee family. It was a Jewish refugee family from the Soviet <laughs> Union. These were perfect strangers right off the boat or the airplane, if you will, but they were looking for volunteers. And I thought, how can I not? And we took six total strangers into our house and they lived with us. Um, and I've worked with some current refugees, uh, 
mostly from Central America. It, it, it's a whole new understanding of, of what people are going through when I was able to get a better understanding of what I lived through. And of course, I came to the United States under a false document. My passport was falsified in order for us to qualify. That's a whole long story. That was part of the um, anti-Semitic uh, regulations put into the 1948 DP Immigration Act. And I'm looking at people now who are coming here who are desperate for better lives. And uh, the Trump administration, for example, has even set up an office of denaturalization. I'm a naturalized American. If they wanted to go after me, they could. And I actually consulted a lawyer before I wrote the book. Uh, my husband's a lawyer and he says, you can't say these things. You're giving them all the evidence to. Um, and he said, you're not without risk. And this is in 2020 in the United States. I have a, it, it, I translated a bunch of letters that I found of my mother's and she had letters it, written, I guess, 46, 47 uh, from her uncle in Brazil. He wanted us to come to Brazil. He again guaranteed that we wouldn't be a burden on the state, that he would take care of everything. He had a farm, it was gonna be fine. And the Brazilians wouldn't let us in. And he, uh, my mother wrote something to him and he wrote to my mother, he says, you're so naive. Don't you understand that nobody wants you? And when we finally got permission to come to the United States, he wrote to us and he said, I'm so happy that you finally ended your wandering. But even in the beautiful United States, and he wrote this in 1949, there is anti-Semitism. Mm. Okay, we, we've, we've got a few minutes left. So I'm gonna try and bunch some questions together. Um, so we've, I've got an interesting questions here, here, which I suppose is related to thinking about some of the preconceptions you might have had before you actually went away and did the research, some of the stories you might have heard, the way that these narratives have always sort of held together nicely in your head. And then uh, as you sort of went along and did the, re the research, things might have happened to sort of push and shift some of these stories. How, how did you deal, like, were there any moments where you thought, oh gosh, I'm pushing a bit too far here. I perhaps, you know, this, I don't want to know this or I might offend people. Like, is it, how, how did you deal with some of these discoveries that didn't fit nicely into these boxes? Hadley. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Um, so yeah, I'm very used to, you know, writing at this point, I've been doing this 20 years. So I always write as though no one's going to read it. But in terms of research, I was a bit worried as I, as I went along that I was gonna find out that my great uncle Alex had been a collaborator and that would explain how he survived and thrived after the war so much. And he wasn't a collaborator, not to spoil or anything there, but it's not a black and white story. Um, I won't say more, but it's not simple. It's not that, you know, he was only dealing with resistance fighters or he was actually selling Jews out to the enemy. It's more complicated than that as wartime is, you know, people make compromises that they might not expect. and. I worried as I wrote, if I did find out that he was a collaborator, what was I going to do? And then I faced that and I still thought I would tell this story. And in the end, I, what I found out was kind of more complicated, and more interesting. And it was thanks to Daniel that he explained the sort of the politics within Vichy government, how there were people in Vichy who, yes, they hated the Jews, but they also, but what their main concern was the sanctity and purity of French politics. So they didn't want France to become Germany. So it's not like they wanted the Nazis to take over France. So that led to complexities where Vichy wasn't entirely, certain members of Vichy weren't entirely working with the Nazis and they were actually helping some Jews who had fought for France before France fell. And that's a very complicated story. And it was really interesting to find out about it and to be able to tell it. What about you, Esther? Anything that any any surprises along the way that might have been uncomfortable? The thing that surprised me was how much I was able to find out. I went in 2009. Uh, I'm very lucky that I did. If I had gone today, a lot of the people would be the eyewitnesses, who, people who told me things are unfortunately now gone. I had very low expectations when I went. I didn't expect to find much. And the surprise was that I did that every shuttle that I went to, um, people would remember something. 
uh, not necessarily in the way I expected them to. But uh, for example, I, I sat with my mother and we did a map of the shtetl of who lived where that I thought would be helpful when I went there. And there was, I was on the main street. My mother told me that her grandfather lived there and who the names of the neighbors and we were going, old people would gather around. I mean, we, this is a Ukrainian town. They don't expect a bunch of Americans walking down the street and they'd all come and surround us and try to figure out what we were looking for and try to help us. And um, it, I had the map of the main street and some old man said Spitz lived here. And I thought, wow, that's a name on my map. And I said, well, if Spitz lived there, where did Aberbuch live? And they said, oh, over there. And I said, so my great-grandfather and my grandfather lived, their family lived here. And the name was Bronstein. And they said, no, no, that's not it. The name was Roisman. So they were remembering the name of the next generation of my grandfather's sister. But they told me the story that, that when the Nazis came, my great-grandfather said, they were trying to round everybody up to go into the ghetto. He said, I'm not going. If you want to, you can just kill me here. And they did. And I knew that he never made it to the ghetto. And I found out why. So it was really, it was finding a lot more than I had expected. And yeah, like you said, I think uh, just from reading your book, one really gets, it was just amazing because you know, there's just so, you, you'll, you'll go, like you said, you prepared yourself to find absolutely nothing. I think Hadley as well, you know, you just think, what could I possibly find 70 years later? Right. Uh, and my goodness, both of these books are just so remarkable in that sense, that there's just still, you know, so much history that remains uh, unexplored. And just by asking the right questions or even the wrong questions, like sometimes in Esther's book, I found, myself thinking, gosh, you know, um, people would correct you with some of the questions you would ask. Um, you know, you, you would ask X, Y, Z, which would seem logical, it seemed, but then as soon as you would start asking ABC, you would get different answers. Yeah. And I found um, uh, quite similar things uh, in Hadley's work too. I think I'm afraid to say that's, a, I will double check with my colleagues at the Vina, but are we, can go on for another few minutes if you want to uh, have one more question I think that would be fine yeah? yeah okay perfect all right let me just look through uh this very long list of questions um actually you know what I would maybe I mean oh, sorry to end on 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 a tragic note um but I'm thinking like we haven't actually really talked about some of the two of the key figures in the books that again are quite important to pushing the narrative forward. And one for me was Hadley's uncle who was deported to Auschwitz. And another uh, interest and another uh, central character in Esther's book is the person who she really, who right at the beginning of the book, Esther discovers somebody, a, a relative of hers who also perished in the Holocaust, who we didn't, who she didn't know about. So if you could perhaps, just tell us the audience a little bit about these characters and how they fit into your stories. Right, so my um, grandmother, I probably should have explained this at the beginning, is the youngest of four and she had three older brothers. And there was Henri, the one who went around microfilming documents and saving them. Then there was Alex, who was the third brother, who was the kind of big hero of the book. And then Jacques was the second brother and he was this very passive, gentle man. And I didn't know anything about him when I started, I just found, photos in my grandmother's shoebox in her closet of this man with spectacles, clearly in what was a concentration camp that he'd managed to smuggle out and send to her. And his story in many ways adheres to the very traditional narrative of immigrant Jew in France during the 1930s. And since he arrived in France, <coughs> he becomes a tailor in the Marais. Um, he's very poor. He just hangs out with other Eastern European Jews um, in 1940 when Jews are told they have to sign up to the census to explain, you know, to say who they are and what their address is. He alone among his brothers did that. And he was then rounded up in the very first roundup of Jews and sent off to Pitivier, which was this French concentration camp. But where his story deviates from this very traditional kind of Schindler's List-esque narrative of Jews uh, in the Holocaust is Alex had always told all of us 
that uh, Jacques had been allowed out of Petivier for two days to visit his wife when she had a new baby. And this seemed improbable. And when I was researching his story, Daniel and I went down to Cercile, which is the um, archive of concentration camps in France. And they said they hadn't heard this, a prisoner being allowed out to visit a newborn baby. That's like not a good reason to allow a Jew out of prison. But when we went to the Shoah Museum in Paris, there on Jacques' ticket of when he was checked in, for want of a better term, to Petit Vier, it says permission to leave 30th of December to the 1st of January. So it's true. Um, and the tragedy is he was allowed out to Paris. He went back to Paris to meet his new baby. And this story was one that Henri, the oldest brother, and Alex always said, which was the brothers tried to convince Jack to run away and they would help hide him. And uh, Jack's wife, Mila, who is not very bright, um, said, il a donné sa parole, he gave his word, which meant he had to return. And so he did. And I'll leave readers out there to find out the rest of that story. Um, but it was this sort of extraordinary weirdness in this very otherwise very traditional narrative. Mm. Absolutely. Well, in, in my case, um, when I was about 40, um, my mother just casually mentioned, we were just having a conversation. I was asking her a few questions. I was always trying to ask questions in indirect ways. And I had asked something about how my father had survived. And she said, well, you know, he was on a work detail when his wife and daughter were killed. And I'm like, you know, he had a wife and daughter and you're telling me this now. And what, you know, I started to probe and she said, well, we didn't talk about the past. I don't, that's all I know. And so, um, you know, I had grown up surrounded by ghosts, my mother's sisters, my father's sister, my grandmother's, my great grandparents, all of whom were killed. But suddenly I had a new ghost and one that didn't have a name. I started scouring databases, couldn't find a name. Uh, she and her mother were among so many people, hundreds of thousands probably who haven't been identified, who nobody knew even lived, much less were killed. And that really propelled my uh, search forward. If I was going to find her name, if I could put her name, and I had made up my mind, if I couldn't, I would put in baby saffron. I would put her somewhere but here was some, I knew nothing about her. I didn't know how old she was. I didn't know what she looked like. Um, and ultimately finding information about her was one of the amazing things about my search. Um, I think we should probably not ask you any more questions about that. We don't want, we, because it really is such a fascinating part of, of, of the book. Similarly uh, with Hadley's quest as well. Um, so I do, I do hope that people do go away and read this, these two, phenomenal uh, historical detective stories. Thank you so much, Dan. And um, before everyone logs off, I just want to say as the director of the library, it's been an absolute privilege to join this discussion this evening. It's so moving and enlightening. These books are, are intensely personal. And I just want to say how much I appreciate Hadley and Esther's openness and uh, sincerity, and, and it's so evident that the extraordinary work that you've put into to these amazing books. I'm really proud too that this is, you know, our first online webinar for the Wiener Holocaust Library has been a, a great success. Um, so just a very short uh, couple of things. So the library's physical doors are closed at the moment, but they're very much open in a virtual sense, as you've seen and heard tonight. Um, you can see details on the screen about how to get hold of all three of the current books of the chair and our two speakers tonight. Uh, I'm sure your appetite has been uh, whetted for, for, for uh, reading more. Um, thank you to uh, Christine, Lara and Sid from the library staff uh, bringing this to your screens. And just as a last note on behalf of the library, I want to say you will have picked up from the news that arts and heritage organisations in general, and especially charities like the library, we depend on the public support to survive and thrive at the moment. So if you're able to do so, we'd be hugely grateful for any donations that might flow from this event. Uh, please visit the donation page on our website. You can see details on the screen. So it just remains with me to say thank you so much to Dan Hadley and Esther. Thank you all for joining. Stay well and have a good evening. Goodbye, everyone. Right.